Hi, just Paulie here. Um, doing some impromptu theatre. Ah, after dance class explaining my cool get up. But yeah, so look, um, I had a friend, David Hanlon. And David was a true character. Oh boy. Met him in university. They had quite small um, college rooms at the university. When I first met this fellow, he was very more, more British than British in many ways. And um, went in to visit him because he was a war gamer. Come into his room. And there's not much room to these. You can just put like a tiny little desk and a, and a single bed and that's about it. But he's got a Union Jack, which has been folded up into a triangle. And he's got that in one corner of the room, a picture of Queen Victoria there, and on either side of it, he's got some of those wonderful kind of Victorian era pictures, regimental pictures with guys in pith helmets all just sitting there or whatever. And he's got another couple of like crossed regimental banners and everything there. It's like a third of his floor space has been taken up by this. It, David, yeah. what, what is this? Ah, that is the corner that is forever England. Um, anyone that was willing to give up, you know, a third of their floor space to a gag in the hope that someone would someday come in and get it, uh, yeah, you're going to be my friend for life. Um, so, yes, that was great. David, he, um, it, terribly handsome and full of charisma, so, uh, yeah, um, girlfriends, not a problem. But uh, this girl, sort of, she left him and everything, and so he's decided that, um, yes, my girlfriend has left me, therefore... I must join the Foreign Legion. What? Oh, God. So you're walking along with him. And if there was a like, there was a building site, he'd race ahead and kind of fling himself on these big mounds of builder sand. He'd be lying there. And as you come up, he's lying there going, Bleach! 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 David, what are you doing? He says, Ah! I'm practicing bleaching my bones in a desert in Chad. He says, Oh, when you get very tired, says, no, no. After a year, you dry out and you can take it easier. Bleach. <laughs> Bleach. <laughs> we convinced him not to go and join the French Foreign Legion. Um, he turned up at my <laughs> he turned up at my place, and I had kittens at the time, so he's he's sort of sleeping in the front room, and um, <laughs> you can just hear. For some reason, he's adopted a uh, South African personality at the time. He's trying to go to bed, but he's trying to sort of... The kittens are running around, playing with him and jumping on his head and everything. You can just hear this voice like, you know, Pussycat, I wish you to show me your passbook. All right, feline, uh, I'm afraid that you are in an area that is not reserved for those of a feline race group. So I must ask you to leave or I shall have to break your furry little legs. <laughs> David, are you interrogating my kittens? No, not necessarily. <laughs> but he, he, if there was like an alternate theatre down the road and it would run, you know, Rocky Horror Show and Blues Brothers and Worst Science Fiction Nights, you know, Plan 9 from Outer Space, Robot Monster, these sorts of things, but you, you got in for free if you're in costume. So we're heading down to a Blues Brothers thing and um, David, oh yeah, I'll come too, said, yeah, okay, um... But, you know, none of us had much money or whatever. It's a, oh, you get in for free if you're in costume, right? Right. And all he had was the one bag that was with him. So he dashes into the room and he comes out in full Nazi brown shirt uniform. Immaculate. Right down to, like, on a dagger and the whole thing. Is it David? Yeah. Why do you have a Nazi brown shirt uniform? in your carry-on luggage from the plane. And it turns out, oh, no, no, no. He was actually he was actually in the Sound of Music musical. He's, he's playing, I am 16, you are 17. Da, 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 da. He's that guy. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But David vanished for a couple of years, and then he comes back. Turns out he's been doing one of those things where you wander um, Asia, uh, teaching English to the locals. He'd been um, wandering around a couple of countries, which he didn't enjoy. He'd gone, and he finally gone to Thailand, which he did not like. He said it was real kind of Sodom and Gomorrah, and didn't, he, he hadn't enjoyed it at all. But he met these short, laughing guys in these bright-coloured clothing who made this absolutely appalling um, kind of rice beer. And they, they just were handing it to him and, like, uh, having a good time. And they said, you don't want to teach English. Come and teach English with us. We really need English teachers. Um 
come with us, come with us, you'll love it. It's up in the mountains. So, all right, sounds like an adventure. And, you know, he was a loony, so off he went. Um, and they were traveling by elephant. He found out what elephants are for. He says, we went, um, we went maybe a couple of hundred miles on elephant, but this was a teak forest. Normally, when a tree falls over in a forest, it eventually rots down. So no, no tree, teak trees just go <clears throat> and sort of stay there. <laughs> and uh, if you were a human being wandering through these things, you'd have to constantly climb over all this sort of timber. So the elephants just stepped over it. So they cruised. He says, oh, he finally figured out, oh, that's what elephants evolved for. Fantastic. Up, 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 they go into these villages where he was just welcomed with joy and they were bringing in all these students from all kinds of places. He had a huge class that he's teaching and people just so thankful. He said, these guys are wandering around, these brightly colored guys, brightly clothed guys, says everyone has over their back um, an AK-47. And everyone's carrying in their arms, usually a long um, musket, kind of a Giselle looking thing. And he said they would just take shots at local wildlife with this, they're hunters. And so they're, they're firing with, you know, they're making their own black powder and their own shot, and they're, essentially they're making their own muskets. Oh, okay. So the AK 47s, you know, bullets are obviously hard to come by, but they're carrying them. Yeah, it finally twigged. He's in Burma, Myanmar. This is, these are the anti government resistance. So. At that stage, and indeed now, Myanmar, they were very much like um, the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia. They were anti-Western, and so they were, like, killing anyone that had... Um, they were killing school teachers and doctors and all these sorts of things. So this was all part of the plan uh, for a better future. People were smuggling all the kids out of the cities, getting them up into the mountains where they were being taught English, and then they were being smuggled out... And they're going off to the West to, to be educated and to get university educations. And the idea is this is the future. They're going to come back and they're going to somehow win, you know, Burma, Myanmar back from these, you know, bastards. And actually, um, you know, so there's hope for the future. So um, David was chuffed. He was actually kind of a part of this rather noble chain. And that what they were doing to pay for it, actually, was it turns out that this region is actually the only place on Earth where red rubies are found red ones the normal rubies are actually slightly brown um, indian and thai rubies but so they were smuggling rubies out to pay for it the guys that he's with they basically they loved him because uh, he was this eccentric crazy person who just delighted in their entire lifestyle so they basically you know oh well, we love you we're inducting you in to the tribe you're one of us you know and so he said so they take him into this hut where they've been like feeding him, looking for him, roll back the flooring, and it's all skulls. It's just these are the headhunters, and this is where this is the centre of the resistance, because the government down on the plains, they don't come up into the mountains because it's head headhunter country. And so these are his guys. But he was saying, someone came running up to him to say, hey, um, uh, Beja, come. And said, oh, Beja, oh, Beja, British, a British man comes. Yes, excellent. What? So this is one path which leads back into Thailand, the one that he'd taken and everything. So he got hastened over there. And he said, there's a guy in this kind of ragged, <laughs> ragged bush walking outfit coming up this, this trail. And it just looks like he's been through hell. He's been rained on and... <laughs> He's been bitten by bugs and you know, he's been out for weeks. He, he just looks up at David and he's got this sort of look of hatred in his eyes, put on a spurt and just made the last few hundred dollars, the yards up, up the mountain and just came up to David. Is your name David Hanlon? Oh, yes, it is. Right. And the guy pulls out this registered letter says, sign here signs it and without waiting for a reply the guy just or a cup of tea or a sandwich the guy just turns around and walks back down the trail into the wilderness david he opens his letter <laughs> it's a final demand from latrobe university for repayment of his student loan <laughs> so he said here i am in the mountains surrounded by my by my trusty headhunter companions locked in my battle against the heavily be weaponed communist um, uh, um, um, government. <laughs> it's like, come and get me, coppers. <laughs> um, he turned up <clears throat> later, um, which is where I heard all this. He, he, he found me, he appeared, told me all his, his interesting troubles. And yes, it got a bit dodgy, I'm afraid, because he starts asking questions about, so you're your, your, your ex-army... Um, ex are you 
helped out in military museums and you helped out tank collectors and everything. Yes, I, I am actually a, a huge tank enthusiast. I, I fell in love with tanks as a little kid and loved them. They were they were a connection with my uh, with my um, grandfather who um, <clears throat> didn't really make it out of El Alamein and everything. But you know, it was like a um, so it was it was a real thing with me. But so yes, I, I have actually driven and crewed uh, an awful lot of antique tanks you know i've driven world war ii ones and i've driven world war one ones um but so, so um would you know how to drive a you know would you know how to drive a centurion um tanks oh centurions i love centurions actually i love centurion tanks it's it's a uh, um it, it, it's a great a great vehicle you know it's a it's a it's a real antique now um but um you know if it's good enough for the israeli army it's good enough for me and uh yes oh yeah no i, I can drive those why well um, i just happened to know so if you needed to you could probably teach people how to drive and possibly operate the guns and everything on a centurion and it's like yeah okay david um at that stage you know i had um wife and kids and so on so i'm not going to pick up and go to burma but just, david see we have a problem there's a little thing called uh, the australian mercenaries act um so certainly i could do that but i can't come home ever again so you know so plus uh nice as your burmese friends are is like i'm looking after a family and can't afford to be you know shot for a bunch of um, people i don't know so but he disappeared off to burma and unfortunately has never been heard from again all attempts to contact him have drawn up a blank so unfortunately after many many years of searching um and by me and a lot of other people i don't know what happened to david one of the funniest people i've ever met an incredible humorist a true eccentric um yeah we'll um we'll live in hope uh david if you're out there for God's sakes, get in touch. Anyway, uh, here's to you. Uh, David, you were a friend and a gentleman and a light under your people, and you were one of a kind. <laughs> Cheers.